Hi, everyone. I can see people still joining, but it's 10.02, so we're going to get started. Um, this is Rebecca Silbert. I know some of you. I'm the Director of Corrections to College. This is part two of the webinar we had a couple of weeks ago about student equity, student equity plans, and formerly incarcerated students becoming a campus priority. Um, first, we're going to just quickly go back through what happened last time so that um, we're all on the same page here in case you missed last time. We're going to just fly through this. So if you were not on last time, uh, you should probably watch the webinar from last time to get more of the details. Um, today, we will be hearing from Ed Aguilar. He's on the line. You're going to hear from me first and then from Ed. Ed is at Delta College out in Stockton. He's the Student Equity and Diversity Manager. Um, we are going to go through a couple of points and answer some questions that came through us online, and then we'll be encouraging you to ask any questions you want. Ed is ready and able to answer questions. Um, you should see a question and answer button probably at the bottom of your screen. I will collect the questions. They're going to be typed through and coming to me. I may not read your question exactly. If we get a couple of questions that are very similar, I will probably combine them for Ed um, so that we don't have to repeat the same answers. Uh, if, you, if something is going wrong with the question and answer through Zoom, you can just email me. My email is Rebecca at theopportunityinstitute.org. So same as Kelly's, which is Kelly at theopportunityinstitute.org, except I'm Rebecca. Um, all right, so quick summary of the first webinar. We were letting everyone know and talking about the fact that the SEA program is part of the California Community College system. So in 2018-19 and on into the future, there is money allocated to support student success. A couple of important points. The money, the, the amount of money, like if you go online and look up how much did my, my area get, it's by community college district, not college. So for example, those of you up here in Oakland or Berkeley, this is the Peralta district. It's four colleges. Now, some of you say um, uh, Cerritos or Rio Hondo, those are single college districts. So your district and your college, if you, you may have only one college in it. If you're in LA, you win with the largest district. Um, and so anything you see about the amount of money allocated will be the total amount going to the whole district for all the colleges. The colleges have to do a district report in 2020, and they have to, this is the critical part, they have to write a student equity plan that they submit to the chancellor's office. Those plans are due on June 30th. This is the time when they are soliciting student input and asking for your inclusion. So. As we went over in the first webinar, this is the time for you to find out who your student equity coordinator is, might be a student equity coordinator or committee, um, figure out where your college is in the process. Do they already have a draft? Are they soliciting input? Are they a little behind the curve? And make your voice heard. That means, uh, well, we'll get into what that means and how you might do that. Understand that the they are required by law to uh, solicit and and receive student input. So what what you have a right to ask for is to be to have your voice heard, to be included in the process. We'll say this again in a little bit to remind everyone that's a little different than you don't have a right to be included in the final plan. We want you to be included, but the what you do have a right to do is to be heard. And so asking for inclusion in the process to make your argument and make your point that you need student support. That's what we are encouraging everyone to do. All right, so those are the student equity plans. That's the general framework in California. We asked you for questions. We'll start with the first. We received a bunch of questions that were very similar, so we combined them. The first question we got, um, and I apologize that this wasn't clear last time, is what is equity money and what can it pay for? So in general, um, you will not be able to get a list of things that say this is allowed, this is allowed, this is allowed. It has to be reasonable and justifiable. It has to be for student success and support. It has to be for equity. It has to be for uh, disproportionately affected student populations. So they're never going to tell you, here's your list of 15 things, what do you want? But we do have some examples which um, would include student support, student services, supplies, training. So that might be, for example, 
um, hosting some professional development training for staff on campus. I heard a story of a financial aid counselor at a, one of the Los Angeles co colleges who couldn't help any of the students because she didn't know what a felony was. Well, those people need some education and training. Um, you often might see equity funds used for something like bus passes or textbook vouchers, or um, sometimes to pay or to cover the cost of a, a designated staff person to be a counselor or a staff person just for formerly incarcerated students. Um, it will vary by campus. But in general, student support, student services, student supplies, and training are four buckets that would be within the realm of what, what you could advocate for. Equally important, what can't it pay for? This is a really long slide with lots of text because we're talking about government rules, which are always long and tedious. Um, the main takeaway here, the money can't go in student pockets. It, this is state budget money for the colleges for student success, and they are not allowed to spend it on gifts or stipends for students. So it has to be something that the college or district believes is an expenditure that will help your success. It will help you succeed, reach degree or credential, transfer if you want, get your credential, get a job, whatever you want, but it will help you succeed in college, but it has to be an expense that they allocate, not cash that transfers to, uh, to students or student goals. Next one. Okay, when you're asking for inclusion, what does that mean? What specifically are we asking, what, what specifically are you asking for? The abridged version, the short version, is that your college is gonna write an equity plan and they're gonna submit that equity plan to the chancellor. In that equity plan, it is going to list in one way or another how they are going to affect disproportionately affected students, how they're gonna to contribute to student success, and it will have things like, we are gonna focus on veterans, comma, foster kids, comma, first, first generation, ELL learners, whatever it is, what you want is for the formerly incarcerated students to be identified in that plan. So you would like the words formerly incarcerated students to appear in that equity document. That's at the most basic level. Um, Ed will talk a little bit later about options that are still available to you if your, your college or district declines. Um, but kind of from the beginning, that means letting your equity folks know that you are on campus, you want to succeed, you can succeed, and you have some needs that can be met by the college which will um, contribute to your success. The colleges want you to succeed. The colleges are rewarded when students succeed. When they maintain uh, levels of units and you reach graduation, that's what they want. And so if you tell them we're here, we want to succeed, but here's something we really need help with. The colleges want to help that. Okay, inclusion in the process versus inclusion in the plan. Inclusion in the process means that they are listening to you, that you're, you have a chance to make your voice heard, that you are able to explain and ask for what you want. Inclusion in the plans mean the words form incarcerated are in that final equity plan. Inclusion in the process is required. Inclusion in the plan is not. So as you go through this, just be aware that you're asking for something. And, and that's not a reason not to ask for it. This is life, right? You, you need to ask for things when you need them. But be aware that they don't have to. So negotiating that with some uh, tact and deference and um, a little bit of thought beforehand can really go a long way. Does each person have the same title? Well, no, because that would be way too easy. Um, however, we have a link. This is a public document available from the Chancellor's Office. It's a link, um, and, and when you download this um, webinar later, you can just go to the link. I, I will say that in my experience with the Chancellor's Office, they're like 90% on having the right people. And um, I'm sure Ed, who's online, may or may not agree, but 
it may not be the right person for right now. It might have been the right person for last semester, but if it's not the right person for right now, it is at least where you would start. Um, so oftentimes it'll be the director of equity or the manager of equity, but if not, look at this document and see who's listed for your campus. Okay. Um, tips. Some of them are going to need an appointment. This is, think of this, the equity manager or whoever it is on your campus, student services, anyone, they have probably 50 things they have to get done tomorrow. And they are also being asked to prepare information and report about how they're serving veterans and how they're serving their first generation students and how they're reaching these other criteria. Oftentimes the person in that office will be easier to approach and more amenable to, to listening to you if you have an appointment for a set amount of time. That way they know you're coming, you're able to prepare, you know how long you have. So they may say just stop by, which is fine, but you may get farther if you start by looking for an appointment. And then prepare ahead of time. Prepare ahead of time because you may not have very much time. You might have 15 minutes, you might have 20 minutes, and you want to be able to make your pitch when you have their ear. So here are some tips. Disproportionate impact is the key term here. Disproportionate impact means, um, it, well, in general, what it will mean is that given, if they look at the data for formerly incarcerated students, that you are having more trouble reaching degree or carrying your units than other student groups. And this is really common in community colleges. It is most certainly not limited to formerly incarcerated students, but it's things like if you also have restitution payments, if you have three jobs, if you have a parole agent that's making you check in on Tuesdays, but the class you need is also on Tuesdays, it's just going to take you longer. It's just going to contribute to your challenges. So disproportionate impact does not mean there's anything wrong with you. It means that you are trying to succeed and there are many things that are in your way and the college can help you. In an ideal world, you would show up at your director of equities office or whatever their name is and you would say, here is the exact number of formerly incarcerated students we have on our campus and here is our data about how many units we are all carrying and how long it is taking us to reach degree. I don't think anyone has that in the state of California. So, use what we call a proxy. If you do not have the exact data that they want, you need to use proxies. Proxies are other numbers, other things that paint the picture of disproportionate impact. Do you have a student club? How many people are in it? Do you have an informal network? Do you have a Facebook page? Did you have an event where you know a lot of people came? Do you just know from your own experience there's 15 other people? Those are proxies, but they're helpful. Same with people on probation or parole in your county. County is not the same as the community college. And for Los Angeles, this is probably less relevant because it's such a big county. But any kind of uh, numbers or data or concrete information will be helpful to you. Um, anecdotes, you know, stories really compelling. The, the best way to do this is to combine the stories and the first person experiences with some numbers. Um, on here when we say that remind folks that data is coming, the community colleges keep all kinds of data. They, they don't track any, any person individually. There's two million students. They're not tracking anyone individually. But they do keep, the, if you looked it up and it's public, you could look it up. How many, what percentage of the students are men? What percentage are women? You know, how many um, reach degree every semester, those kinds of things, aggregate information. Their system, the community college system, does allow them to say how many formerly incarcerated students they have on their campus. Now that's brand new. So not only do most of them not yet maybe know that they have it or they're not using it, but of course, no one can ever force you to disclose your status. No one can ever tell you that you should. Um, so it's a little tricky right now, and it is brand new, so no one really knows how this is going to roll out, but more data will be coming all the time. And these equity plans go over a couple of years, so you can say to your equity person, look, this is what we know now, but we will know more next year. 
present yourself as a partner in the work and be diplomatic, that goes back to the fact that you're asking for something. And this is, this is just, look, the best way to get what you want is not to walk in and demand it and throw down and then stomp out when you don't get it. The best way is to think about making your pitch, explaining, telling your story, saying we'll help you. There have been campuses, for example, that have used equity money to host professional development or restorative justice convenings where students came and spoke and where faculty were trained. And those were done in partnership with students and student clubs. Uh, okay. I can't remember if I'm giving off to Ed right here. <laughs> uh, so maybe I will. Are student clubs allowed to submit proposals? I think the answer is no, because they cannot just hand money to a club. But I will now hand it off to Ed to say, if you have a student club, what should you do? Um, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Uh, first oh, they're of, muted. OK, yes. but first but no one, No one's typing in that they can't hear, so I think we're good. OK, so first of all, I wanted to thank Rebecca and Kelly for putting together this webinar, the Opportunity Institute and Stanford's Law Center. This is, this is an important conversation to continue to have. And mind you, it's a conversation that we're, we're all engaged in throughout the, the, the state. So let me, let me respond to the question at hand, and then maybe I'll, I'll jump back to a couple of the responses that Rebecca covered earlier. So in general, equity funds are provided to the college to support disproportionately impacted students that each college and district identifies. Because clubs, through their own governance structure, have fundraising mechanisms built into them, equity funds are not provided to clubs. However, a college or district can have a partnership with a club, for example, what Rebecca just shared, hosting an institute on restorative justice. And I'll, I'll use that as, a, as an example right now because our campus is looking to host an institute on restorative justice. We don't have a student club on our campus yet, but I am working with students and advocating with students that they begin a club and that becomes a partnership. So there's ways to leverage equity funds to support clubs. Um, however, because a college or district can look at their equity plan and funds and if they determine as a college or a district that they would like to support clubs they would probably do so and ensure that every club had some sort of access to those funds so colleges and districts may explore it differently but in general no there aren't it's not a grant application to submit to to equity funds to support a club All right, the next question, which came in earlier, is that some students had been told, they approached their director of equity and were told, you're fine because we've got Emoja, UPS, whatever it is. So how should they na navigate that response? And you know, and I appreciate my colleagues, and the reason I wanna appreciate this comment is because there is a lot of intersection between um, students and, and their various identities. Um, and, and in a case like this, you might have a student who's currently or formerly incarcerated, and there's a high chance that they're either going to be low income, which would qualify them for EOPS. They might be a student of color, Chicano Latina, uh, qualifying for La Casa, or African American Emoja, or formal, uh, foster youth, or veteran. So some campuses might explore those caveats, those programs, but I think it's very important that a student whose um, primary identifier is systems impacted or justice impacted or formally incarcerated, um, lets that be known in a diplomatic way that you understand those programs are opportunities, um, but yet there is a cohort of students on the campus that primarily identify as formally incarcerated, and that's where you're exploring how your voice can be recognized, how your collective can be possibly supported. Um, but I am gonna encourage students as well, if you qualify for those programs, get into some of those programs because they are gonna be supported by equity, but they're also phenomenal support programs for students. They have a lot of wraparound services. So I will not exclude those students who are interested in those programs and I'll encourage that, but it's also important that you acknowledge that and, and just let your campus colleagues know that you, you understand that, you appreciate that offer, but there's still a collective voice that you want to make sure is, is heard. And they're going to respect that. They're going to hear you out. And that's where self-advocacy in a diplomatic way is very, very powerful. 
Okay, so here's a question, um, and this is sort of combining some. If students, if what they really want, what, what they really need are things like textbook vouchers, bus vouchers, food cards, um, or you know, supplies for some of the CTE programs, how, how does that happen on a campus? Like how are those things, if they're not in EOPNS, for example, how are those vouchers and, and supplies getting to them? So again, this is gonna be a campus by campus and a district by district approach. Um, you, you, again, starting with your equity officer, if you will, because our titles are gonna vary from manager, coordinator, to director, to dean. So you're looking for the, the equity officer. And some of the um, approaches are going to be, and that's where some of the colleague, uh, our, my campus colleagues might be recommending to get involved in some of these programs because allocations of funds or funds are then provided to those programs that can help support with bus passes, with gas cards, with um, parking permits, with textbooks, with school supplies. And so they might be encouraging you to, to pursue that route. However, some offices of equity have what, what they call sort of an emergency fund an opportunity where a student is caught between a rock and a hard place because financial aid hasn't kicked in yet, or there's a different circumstance, and they'll consider those emergency requests. And I know at our campus, uh, in my office, we manage that for some students who might need help with a textbook, a backpack, um, or some other support. I would start with your equity officer, but again, not every campus may have such a program because they, 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 they make sure that the funds are allocated to all the different programs and initiatives. Um, other things to explore too somehow, and I, and I know students always want a textbook and they want to get their hands on a textbook, but other initiatives that colleges support are um, uh, reserve libraries or um, they'll ensure that textbooks are available in the library for students to be able to check out and use. Some campuses might have um, book voucher programs that are administered through the financial aid office, so I would explore in that capacity. I do know that programs such as EOPS they also have a book voucher program. So you're, you're gonna have to inquire a bit on, on that particular notion. And, and you know, just, just ask if, if, if they have an emergency fund or if they have a reserve library, or if they have some sort of opportunity to support a student's um, education needs. One other caveat on that is very important for students to understand is our offices, the offices of equity across the campus, we work in partnership with financial aid because a student's financial aid award is gonna indicate how much money you receive for textbooks, for school supplies, for transportation, all right? So equity funds cannot be provided to students we, directly because we don't want to compromise your financial aid package. So we work with financial aid to see if there's any unmet need. And then that allows offices of equity to be able to help meet some of that unmet need. So that's also very important to understand as students or administrators or faculty, whoever's on this, this webinar, um, to work in partnership with, with your financial aid office. And I would also say that if, if you are approaching your campus and your campus, um, you know, look, there's 114, 15 if you count the online colleges, and they really vary in how they staff programs to provide student support. So if your college is, shall we say, a little less inspired, in terms of their staffing structure. Um, one thing to do would be to either email Kelly or Danny Mario, who many of you know, or me, or go to our directory on the Corrections to College webpage and find another college that's doing it differently, and we, we can help you with that. Um, sometimes you just need to um, helpfully provide some information about how another college might be doing it to, uh, as a way of assisting your college in, come, in being a little creative. Okay, another question came up. So this is looking into the future, Ed. Let's say they've made it into the plan and a year from now, there's sort of no response and nothing's happening. What, what does it mean once they're in the plan? What can they then ask for or follow up on? Um, and that's a, a, an excellent question. So the context again, the student equity plan that is due June 30th is a three-year plan and um, it's referred to as a living document. And what we mean by that is it can ebb and flow and adjust as needed as we're implementing it, right? But understand, and for those of you who are in education, whether you're a student or not, a lot of these, time, a lot of these efforts take time. But I think by a year, if you haven't seen anything or there hasn't been any action, if you will, um, circle back and check in. 
and extend yourself as a resource, you as students who have walked this life and continue to walk this life and experience, you're a resource to the college. You have um, skills, you have knowledge, you have abilities that you can contribute and offer that support. Um, whether it's you know serving on a panel, whether it's recruiting other students for events, whether it's uh, contacting some community-based organizations that are involved in this work and serving as a bridge in the community, whether it's, you know, if, if you have a relationship with your probation or parole officer as a resource as well, and remind the campuses that you're there to support, but um, you'd like to see where they are in the process. You know, after a year, that might be a quite a long time, you know. Um, it would, probably wouldn't hurt to check in in six months, you know. Just remind our campus colleagues that you're here to help um, and just, just keeping the, the process honest. But be mindful, it is a three-year plan, and so some things take a little longer to, to unfold, and that's, that's just one of the realities of, of higher education in general, but in particular with our, our community colleges. And what happens if they go through this process and the college says, thanks, but no thanks, and the words formerly incarcerated did not appear in the plan? What then? Well, so, um, and, and again, I, I have to recognize my colleagues throughout the state as equity officers, you know, majority of us, if not all of us, have been engaged in this work for some time. And I think just by, um, by default, we recognize that formerly incarcerated and currently incarcerated students are gonna be disproportionately impacted on our campus. However, as an equity officer, I have to align my plan, make recommendations for the plan that are in alignment with the district's plan or the vision or guided pathways, right? And so um, it is important though to in some capacity be recognized as a student population. And if you're not literally written into the plan, then stay involved and engaged in the conversation. As I open my comments, this is a conversation that's gonna to continue to, to go. Um, and, and sometimes it's tough for us, and I remember as a student, because there's some things we wanted to see action on now. But I have to remember, by me being involved in the process, by me being involved in the conversation and, and staying on the radar, it makes it easier for my fellow peers who are coming up behind me in a few years, et cetera. So stay involved in the conversation. If if you're, you're, you may run into some individuals that are gonna say, yeah, we got it done, we're good, we got it covered, and, and you've gotta accept okay. that, but then follow back in six months or a year and see where the conversation is. Great, we have um, two questions that uh, are not actually related to equity plans, but I'm gonna answer them because we have the answers. Uh, the first one is about how to start a student club. Um, there are a couple of answers to this. That, uh, the easiest answer I can give you is that Danny, who many of you know who works for me, uh, has been out and about in the state collecting information from different campuses about how to start a student club. And we've built a, like just a short two-page cheat sheet about how to do it. We're just double-checking the formatting of that. It should be out in like a week or two. So stay tuned. Go back to our webpage in two weeks and find that. And that kind of walks you through the process. Um, it, yeah. The, or, or you could just email Danny, Danny at the Opportunity Institute.org, and he can walk you through that. Um, and Ed, if you want to chime in about Student Club, you can. First, the other question, let me just answer quickly the other question, which is about employment. Um, and this is something that uh, is not about equity, but, or it's not about the equity plans, it's clearly about equity. Um, all of you should know that we just finished a year of cooperating with the Chancellor's Office and we're really, really proud of them because they just issued a legal guidance to their campuses and a policy guidance to their campuses. It's two different documents. They are both on the Chancellor's webpage and on our webpage that walks the campus through fair chance hiring. The policy guidance in particular, which just came out on February 8th, has pretty strong language encouraging all the campuses to be fair chance hiring sites and to open hiring opportunities, not only to student workers with records, but also to full-time, long-term faculty and staff. So uh, it, it, the state has been a little bit all over the place for the last couple of years, but with these new documents that just came out a couple weeks ago, they should solve that problem. So I'll jump back to you, Ed, about the student club thing. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. I just wanted to comment on that as well. And some, some, some suggestions in pursuing um, support on a campus, and I'm gonna use self as an example. 
Um, I have been approached by many clubs on campus to serve as a co-advisor, and I had to politely um, say no thank you to the opportunity because I want to be a general support for all, all clubs, but one in particular that's, that's starting to get some groundswell on our campus is, is a club for formerly incarcerated students. And what's important is clubs are going to need a faculty advisor primarily on your campus. And sometimes they'll allow um, dual advisors where you can have another faculty member or a manager. And some areas to explore in your faculty ranks at your colleges are those faculty that if they're already public about their support, those are the ones to turn to. But also faculty that are teaching maybe in administrative justice or criminal justice or sociology um, or are affiliated with a program like a pathway to law program or something like that. Those are faculty that have a knowledge base and experience base that would be great candidates to ask if they would be open to serving as, as an advisor. And you can also look at folks that are in equity work or equity officers such as myself. You might find some staff that are affiliated with the EOPS program, um, foster youth program, veterans program. Those staff members are also good co-advisor opportunities. It's not to exclude any other folks on the campus, right? But there are some individuals whose work is already paralleling um, what you're seeking when it comes to support for, for a club. And I would encourage you to do that. Um, and then if I may, just a little bit on the employment, I also want to acknowledge our chancellor's office of what they've come out with, but we had already been exploring with our campus um, human resources and risk management office to, um, to advocate for students. But what I am going to share with you as a student is, you know, just be transparent on the application. If you're applying for a job or you're applying to be a volunteer on campus to, to, to get involved and engage, be transparent on the application and explain it. You know, don't try to hide anything because all volunteers, all staff, students, faculty, and, and administrators, they do background checks, right? And so it's gonna come out anyway. So it's best to be transparent and open and 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 but use that as 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 an experience set that's a, a resource for the college. Because you you absolutely have skills, knowledge, and abilities beyond your intelligence. You have life experience that, that adds value not only to you, to the institute, to support other students as well. So the, um, the new, the legal structure in California actually doesn't allow the question on the application. Um, they can't run the background check until after you have an offer of employment. So oh. for the official HR documents, that's not there anymore or shouldn't be there anymore. Um, that does not mean that if you have a champion We've now gone off topic, but um, we'll come back in a minute. If you have a champion on campus, if you have a, a faculty member or a staff person or a director who supports you and wants you to get hired, talk to that person about how to manage the process. There's, there's a difference between the formal HR documents, which cannot ask until the very end, and how you might want to negotiate that. And finding someone to back you up and walk you through it is critically important. So, and on that note, um, there's a question about student work study or student workers. Can equity funds, can students advocate to have equity funds be used to, for example, staff a, a peer mentoring or a, a, you know, a, a program that employs formerly incarcerated students on campus as peer tutors or mentors or whatever it's called using equity funds? Uh, the short answer, yes. Um, equity funds can be used to hire students in various capacities, whether it's a, a student ambassador, whether they're doing outreach, whether they're tutoring, or whether they're working for a program or a particular population, veterans, foster youth, formerly incarcerated, uh, LGBTQ+, plus, uh, homeless students. So equity funds can be used for that purpose. Colleges and districts are going to vary, though, in how they go about um, um, conducting that particular business. And I'll use SELF at our campus as an example. One program we're working on developing is sort of an equity ambassador uh, program where we'll be able to hire students that can reach out and work with the various groups that will include formerly incarcerated students who are interested in applying. But because it's a paid position, they'll have to go through the application process. But those are students that if I I want to advocate for, I, as Rebecca said, I would. I would I would contact my HR office through the application process. If they had any questions or concerns, I would advocate um, for students in that capacity. So yes, equity funds can be used in that capacity. Explore that with your campus equity officers. Um, what opportunities 
are in the plan or might be forthcoming. So we have reached the end of the questions that have been sent in through the webinar. Does anyone have any other questions? If you do, um, find the Q&A button, type in the question. If for some reason that's not working, you can send me an email at uh, Rebecca at the Opportunity Institute dot org. Um, I will give it one more minute, then we will let everyone go. If you have further questions, you can always email me or email Kelly or Danny. Um, if we don't know the answer, we may punt you over to to someone or find out the answer from someone at your college. Um, but we are here to help. All right, looks like no questions. So thank you, everyone. This will be available online. Um, hopefully this has helpful. And if you feel so inclined, please do drop us a note and let us know how it's going. We're very interested. We, you know, our goal is there are what 72 districts in the state of California. We would love for there to, you know, have 72 equity plans to talk about formerly incarcerated students. Even some fewer than that would be an enormous victory. So go forth and, and advocate. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Ed.